name is Lucia Tiscornia. I am an assistant professor in the Division of International Studies at the Center for Research and Teaching in Economics, or CIDE, as many people know it, uh, which is a research intensive uh, public university in Mexico City. Uh, so I research and teach on issues related to security with a particular focus uh, on policing and police violence, as well as criminal violence. How did you first come across EGAP or Evidence in Governance and Politics and why did you decide to become a member? A colleague of mine mentioned it uh, in kind of casually in conversation that she was a member of this network. Uh, and so I became curious. I think it was, it was also, you know, you started hearing more and more about it, you know, in, in, in academic circles, if you're, if you're in, interested in in sort of experimental research in, in, well, in political science, which is my field, but they, they're a broader network uh, that's also interdisciplinary. So that was, well, one appeal, one, one, one thing that was appealing to me is, is this idea of connecting, you know, with a larger group of people from different kinds of backgrounds in the social sciences uh, that are interested in experimental research. Another thing that was interesting to me is, I'm sorry about the street noise, um, is the fact that they focus on using that experimental research to answer policy-centered questions. And so the intersection between academia and policy is a space that I always wanted to be in and try to contribute, make a contribution. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that there is an organization that intentionally connects uh, researchers uh, from academia with researchers and policymakers, you know, and, and in other kinds of organizations, uh, I think is is enriching and important. And this year, EGAP decided to provide some small grants to support research studying governance during COVID. I know that your proposal was one that was selected. Can you describe a little bit how it came to you and what you hope to study? Since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we've seen, you know, multiple news reports about how criminal organizations in certain parts of Mexico have adopted, you know, violent strategies to enforce uh, arbitrary lockdowns, uh, whereas others were providing, you know, neighborhood residents with maybe food or offering to pay bills. Uh, so sort of more benevolent uh, control strategies. Uh, so our goal with the project is to understand you know, why criminal organizations have employed uh, these differential strategies to control local populations uh, in the context of the, of the pandemic. Uh, so substantively, this is important because we know very little about you know, criminal social control strategies versus, for example, political strategies. So what do I mean by that? So we know a lot more about, you know, under what conditions there will be violence against the state or against politicians or confrontations you know, with, the, with the security apparatus. Uh, but we don't know as much about why criminal groups deploy different, different control strategies when it comes to the communities uh, that they interact with. We know that some of that is related to uh, you know, territorial control for purposes of, of drug, tra drug trafficking. Uh, and so, you know, having popul populations on your side means less of a chance of, you know, people telling on you um, and, you know, kind of like more, more collaboration. Uh, is that still what is going on or has the pandemic imposed, you know, other layers of complexity uh, that have sort of led criminal groups to adapt what they were doing to kind of like, you know, adapt to the pandemic context. So the project is, you know, an impetus to explore, you know, those aspects and, and really also from a policy standpoint, you know, having more information about what strategies these groups develop can give insights hopefully to policymakers and advocacy groups about, you know, how to reduce criminal groups influence at the community level. It may also shed light on, you know, where social policy or other types of policies are lacking uh, and what tools are being used to kind of bypass the state. Uh, so we're hoping to really make a contribution that's a, that focuses now on the pandemic, but that goes beyond that. What are some of the constraints you face as a researcher in designing experimental research during a pandemic? Doing uh, security research has its own challenges. Uh, some of them are, you know, exacerbated by, by COVID and others, you know, 
sort of stem from the pandemic itself. You're asking people to recall events that might be traumatic to them. Uh, there's sometimes uh, what we call in, in social science research, social desirability bias. So people might avoid you know, giving an opinion because they think that it might be perceived as socially unpopular or undesirable or because they're afraid uh, of retribution, perhaps. Uh, there are also challenges uh, in terms of your own personal security as a researcher. So sometimes you don't know exactly who you're speaking with or who else might be, you know, hearing or learning about your conversations. So if you're doing, you know, Zoom interviews, you have to think about, you know, to what extent are you able to get informed consent from the person that's on the other side of the of the screen? Now all of a sudden you have this, you have a camera, you have a some some level of separation from the person you're interviewing. You're not always sure if somebody else is in the room. You have no way of monitoring that you have no way of asking the person to go somewhere else. I know that much of your past research has looked at the causes and effects of police reform initiatives. And it strikes me that during COVID in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in the United States, there have been major protests against police abuse. So I wonder, you know, as a researcher who studied this in multiple contexts, do you think that there will ever be a police reform movement that is cross country, that is global, or is it too context specific in each place? The cha I think the challenge there is that, you know, police are national institutions that focus on domestic, uh, you know, um, law enforcement or ma the management of, you know, people's relationships at the domestic level. And that is filtered through domestic regulations. Uh, and there's only so much that a global movement can do, I think, in pushing, you know, changes that are ultimately at the very, at the very local level. Um, so it could be, you know, it could work as a, it could work as a push, but then you need that to translate into the local uh, in very concrete ways, I think. So what advice do you have for donors who fund governance research? Let me mention perhaps three things. Uh, so one uh, that I think is a very important one is uh, I would encourage them to continue to support research in the global south and by historically underrepresented groups. Uh, I think there's a tendency to want to support, you know, established wealthy institutions with established researchers that have access to other resources. Uh, there's a lot of excellent researchers, you know, in Mexico and elsewhere who may not have uh, the same access to these opportunities, but when they do, they can really achieve the same quality of research uh, and also offer their unique perspective, you know, that complements this existing research. Another point, I think, you know, thinking about the research that we're doing here in Mexico is I think the importance of funding projects that have a focus on, you know, variation within countries, so at the local level. Uh, so research like ours contributes in understanding that organized crime in Mexico is not one thing, but multiple local processes that are not one and the same. Uh, so, you know, in organized crime, like in research and, you know, violence research about other topics, like in civil wars or, or, or other things has already shown us that, you know, violence does not distribute equally across the entirety of a country. And so understanding well, why are there differences at the, within the same country uh, is, is important. And then a final and uh, important point about governance research is that its translation into policy implications or recommendations is not necessarily automatic. Uh, and so, you know, traditional academic research and policy tend to be these two sort of separate silos that don't always communicate well with one another. And that happens, you know, for a host of reasons. But it is important to support academics or institutions that prioritize translating meaningful research into actionable policy recommendations. So otherwise, the, the, the potential impact of that research is diminished. Uh, and so to kind of circle back to our, you know, the beginning of our conversation, uh, continuing to support institutions like EGAP that are intentionally designed to facilitate conversations between academics and policymakers across the globe, 
uh, and that also do, you know, have this training component that I was talking about at the beginning uh, in a grant system uh, that gives access to us, you know, outside of, you know, perhaps the, the, the more uh, resource endowed universities in, in other parts of the globe is, I feel, is key.